Hi, Travis. Good morning. It's good to have you with us again. Yeah, it's good to be back. Yeah, I uh, I read this quote the other day from Alex, or not Alex, from Mark Rothko. You, you familiar with Mark Rothko's artwork? I'm not familiar with Mark Rothko. Oh, okay. Well, you need to look him up online one of these days. But he was he was famous in the mid 20th century for doing what's called color field paintings. Okay. So like a painting might be all red, but it would be a red that was just vibrating off the canvas because he mm -hmm. had mixed many different reds and laid them next to each other. And Okay. Okay. So um, he, he started a whole movement in this area of color field. And here's the quote from him. I'd like to get your response to it. He said, if you are only moved by color relationships, you're missing the point. I am interested in exploring the big emotions, tragedy, ecstasy, doom. So you're a musician, Travis. <laughs> <laughs> when, you, when you compose your original work, um, are you interested in expressing the big emotions or are you just looking for a certain sound or, you know, what's going on inside your head when you're, when you're composing? I think, well, part of it comes down to how much, this is, this is a big question too, how much agency do I have in composition? Oh, agency, that's a good one. We're going to talk about that too. <laughs> um, because, and this is, this is legitimately, the seed of nearly everything I've ever written just came to me. Uh, this is you know, people talk about this all the time. It's just like you know, basically you just kind of keep the antenna up, and then the idea is there, and then you just work with it. So, I think when it comes down to does this convey the big emotions or that sort of thing, I would say that I approach that kind of more on the is this salient more than like how it how it affects my salience perception versus how it affects the original idea because the idea shows up, but I can't say that if I go mining for the idea, I very regularly won't find it, but it'll, it'll, it'll come to me and uh -huh. then I have to figure out what I'm going to do with it. And I can manipulate it once it's there, but I, I, I can't say I've ever just sat down and like, okay, I mean, and it gets tough. Like, okay, I'm gonna I'm gonna do something in F sharp. I need something in F sharp, and I'll just sit and do stuff. But I don't know. It's 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 a weird thing. <laughs> wow, that that's a big that's a big idea, Travis. I really like that um, because I I mean I have the same experience when painting. Yeah. That, that the 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 original idea will come, and then you know maybe I sometimes I over intellectualize what I do with it or I overanalyze what I do with it. But the original idea is there maybe. And, and so I don't know if we talked about this last time or not, but I have this um, in the book, Art and Fear, he talks about how your vision always outruns your skill. Yeah. You have this vision, you have this picture of what you're gonna accomplish. And maybe it takes you a long time to get there because you have to, over the years, build up the skill to approach that vision. but. But the vision is there. The vision is kind of a given. And, and yeah. that's a very strange, that's a very mysterious thing. That actually plays into something that I had thought about just this morning. Um, basically, and this it goes back to, actually, when I used to teach guitar. Um, the idea of skill matching your ability to integrate that skill into useful either performance or expression or what have you, creation. Mm -hmm. um, and, and to give an example would be, I remember having students who had knowledge that they, they knew. So for example, they'd have knowledge of, of music theory or they'd have the ability to, you know, say play something on the guitar or what have you. That was, it was fairly advanced, but it wasn't integrated in a way that it was useful. And I think, I think that's probably common across a lot of things and even probably across a lot of fields where you have a technical skill or a technical ability or technical knowledge, 
but you don't have it integrated into the bigger process where you need it, where you can use it, say, on the fly in performance or on the fly in composition or, or really get the use out of the technical knowledge. It's, it's, it's kind of the opposite. And um, uh, one of my best friends, um, he was co-guitarist with me in a band, and we were, we were completely opposite music education-wise. So he was a music major, um, guitar performance guy, and so he had, you know, years upon years upon years upon years of guitar lessons. I had, I think, six. <laughs> and we kind of wound up landing at about the same ability level. And the difference was that I could only, I only learned things as far as I was able to use them. And he would learn things, but he hadn't learned how to use them. And so we wound up at kind of the same place, but you know, he, he felt like I had integrated because I had to make use of what, what little knowledge I had or what little ability I had and get the most out of it until I could get something else mastered because I didn't have someone just forcing me to learn stuff. Mm -hmm. Whereas he was learning the stuff, but there was nobody forcing him to integrate it. <clears throat> so it was, it was a complete inversion between me and him on how we had learned. And right, right, because you don't know, you don't know what you can accomplish with what you're learning until you actually do it. Yeah, yeah, exactly. <laughs> and and you, you don't find out where your failures are or where your weaknesses are until you actually implement what you've learned. And so you can't grow until you begin yeah. implementing, right? Exactly. And, and I think to a degree, and, and people vary widely on this, I think for me, regardless of whether it's music or whether it's visual arts or what have you, if you have someone who has a very good idea, just a, just, just a really good idea, and they're you know, like 80% on execution, I would much rather hear, view, read, etc. Mm -hmm. that than something that's you know, an 80% idea with 110% execution, sort of. You know, where it's where it's just it's just yeah. polished to perfection, but it's kind yeah. of trite. Yeah. You know? <laughs> yep. I totally get you. And there's people who are totally the opposite from me on that. I mean, it really is sort of a, a an aesthetic preference, I guess. But you know. Well, I'm thank I'm thankful that that's true because I'm usually about fifty percent on the execution. But <laughs> <laughs> Usually there's an idea there that people can resonate with. So that, <laughs> that gets me a little ways. Uh, so you were talking about skill versus knowledge and, and the integration of them. And it made me think about the last time we talked, we were talking about muscle memory. Mm -hmm. And so how would you connect those two things? Um, well, muscle memory really kind of comes down to and I suppose it really kind of comes down to a neurological process of consolidating information to such a degree that you can, you don't even have to consciously think about what you're doing to do it. You just need to know that that's what you want to do. And, you know, I, I think. That's a very mysterious um, process, isn't it? It really is. And, and, and they say, and this is, this is um, it's something I read a long time ago, so it's probably three quarters wrong, but um, that uh, after a certain point, um, your processing for a lot of the stuff we call muscle memory literally is happening in the neurons that aren't even in your brain. It's happening along the neural pathways, you know, say for example, like playing guitar, okay, if it's, if it's a very left and right hand kind of thing, which obviously it should be if you're playing the guitar, um, <laughs> that the actual triggering, the actual... It, it, the signal never actually hits your brain. Your, wow. your brain you, you fire off the thing that you're going to do and your hands just do it. And that it's all processed within the neural pathways within your arms and hands and never actually gets to your brain and back. Hmm. And which would explain why, um, why you can do these things so quickly um, to, to, to do a complete, you know, in a completely different direction. Um, you know, since it's pro football preseason, I've been watching a bunch of stuff like that because I miss football. But <laughs> um, the speed that they're playing, and, and, and a big part of like guys who are going from college to professional, and um, a big part of it is getting used to playing speed and being able to process 
things that are happening and develop muscle memory on a much wider scale because they need to be able to move their entire bodies in fractions of a second. And if you're, you know, depending on what you're doing, if you're a fraction of a second off, you've just blown a play. You've just lost it, you know, because yeah. they're, they're operating at such a high level. And muscle memory for, for these guys is training your body to just intuitively be able to react on a visual stimulus so quickly. And, 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 you know, so, and so, yeah, that's what they say is that the processing happens before you, you can't even think about it. You just process, process it and move on. So why should we even be capable of that? That is, I mean, that, that's a really fascinating thing. Why our, our human bodies are built in such a way and why our brains are built in such a way that we're capable of that level of. Yeah. And, and how few of us explore that capability. Yeah, and then, and, and then there's little bits of it when you think about like a reflex that's instinctive. That you don't even think about like, like the jump at a sound or that sort of thing. Mm -hmm. uh, obviously it's, it's physical movement based on a stimulus that you, you just react and, mm -hmm. and it's, you know, incredibly quick. Sometimes it's, it's kind of like, I'm, I'm kind of semi notorious for this. Um, at work, I have this too tall water bottle that sits at my desk and I'm notorious for brushing into it when I've stood up, um, I'm talking to one of my people in my cubicle, um, of brushing into it when it's empty and knocking it part way over and just, <laughs> and the reaction is is so quick and unnecessarily violent that I uh, just you know knock the thing the rest of the way over because it's empty and of course there's no weight to it and just uh. <laughs> well I, I wonder if this connects into I don't know if you've ever heard of um, this scientist named I think Libet was his name and he did some research on free will okay and um, in this research he he discovered that, well, he had people choosing to do something. I can't remember the exact research, but you can, if you look it up, you'll find it. Um, they discovered that there's a, a neuron that fires just before the person makes the choice. And so they, they, he came up with the theory that we don't actually have free will that the decision is there before we decide, okay? Mm -hmm. But, and so a lot of people have used that to say that we don't have free will and therefore it's completely deterministic and we live in a materialist world and we have yeah. no choice and our future is planned out for us before we ever begin. Yeah. But, but he said, he went one step further and he had people decide to do something and then decide not to do it. Uh -huh. And the neuron would fire just before they decided to do it. But when they decided not to do it, there was no such neuron firing. So he said, people yeah. don't have free will, but they do have free won't. Oh, so it's basically Lutheran. <laughs> Tell me more. Okay, well, that, that's basically... <laughs> That's basically the Lutheran view of the election in a nutshell <laughs> is, uh, is uh, um, you know, so, so like, you know, you have Calvinist view of, views of elections. So that's, you know, we, you know this double predestination thing. Um, uh, Lutheran predestination is basically the idea of universal atonement. So Christ died for all, even, you know, with the knowledge that not all would be saved. And so I guess the short of it is that, uh, there's universal atonement, but not all will be saved because people do not have free will to be saved, but they do have will to reject. Ah, okay. Looking at it that way. <clears throat> yeah. So, so, so if you're saved, it's not because of your doing, but if you reject, it's because of your doing. Okay. So it works both ways then. It's not only that um, we have moral agency to decide not to do the right thing, but we also have moral agency to not do the right thing. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. we're, we're, we're. I mean, we have moral agency to not do the wrong thing, but we also have moral agency to not do the right thing. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And then um, that's the reality. You have to deal with it. <clears throat> you can't, um, a lot of people try, and I've done this myself, 
try yeah. to live in some kind of utopia, some world that we've created inside our own heads, and we expect the world to uh, conform to us. Yeah. But um, that only lasts so long. <laughs> <laughs> And we fall over into chaos or disaster yeah. or you know some fatal error or something yeah. and and um, those are our opportunities for learning and what we're really learning in those opportunities is what reality is right yeah yeah well and I, and I think there's there's a way to achieve between those two because I think I think it's a bottom up versus a top down view of it your rea reality is that which governs if you look at governs as you know that which requires conformity. And if you look at reality as the, oh, what was the Peterson one again? It was the phenomena arising from? That, the, the phenomena that emerge as a consequence of ongoing behavior. Okay, so, I mean, it, it makes sense. It's like one is coming coming up from below, the other one is coming down, you know, more from above, you know, because, the, you know, the phenomena that arise from as the result of ongoing behavior would be the state that emerges from things that happened as opposed to the state that emerges from things that didn't happen right so this so is the state that is emergent of, from the things that happen would be that which requires you to conform to it yes otherwise you're living in a non-reality you're really you're living in something that is the result of well things that didn't happen or things that yeah, don't exist or things that you imagined or you're you living know. in your mother's basement or something yeah. like that. <laughs> and I, I think to some degree, we all live in some degree of non-reality. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. I would had this idea however many years ago um, that civilization is, is to a degree a buffer against reality. And we can s continually buffer ourselves against reality in a way. And the thing that got me th thinking about that, this was, this was 10 years ago actually, um, we had a, a pretty bad flood um, in Fargo, at Fargo Moorhead, and um, I remember that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It was I had the pictures. Uh -huh. And uh, so, where we were living at the time, we were actually in an evacuation zone, and um, you know, they didn't force us to evacuate. So, I mean, it was we didn't have water in our house, but uh, I was working at the time um, for a company that let us basically have the week off if we'd go and build sandbag dikes and stuff like that. So. So that's what I did, and me and my buddy from work, we hopped into buses and went into backyards and built dikes and, you know, strung tarp around and filled sandbags and this and that. And then when that was done, then because I was in the evacuation zone, I still had more days off. So then I was, you know, sort of checking all of my plugs in my basement and going over and, and you know, all this stuff. And eating ibuprofen and snarfing down bananas and living on coffee and sleeping three hours a day. And, and then it was over and it was, it was fine and we didn't have any damage or anything. And then I went back to work and it was pointless. It seemed utterly pointless. The work that I was doing seemed stupid and trivial and unimportant because for better than a week, I'd been living in a situation where everything that I was doing had at least a conceptual degree of hyper importance mm -hmm. because there is a river there is water it is rising this is real this is very much the case this is where I live this is where these people live we're trying to save houses we're trying to do this or that and so it was of extreme importance and it was very direct to I'm working on technical documentation for the IT department for a health insurance company. You know, like you're, you're however many degrees of abstraction removed from this really mattering. And you, and, and it was so evident from week to week <laughs> that, I, that I sat and I said to my body, I'm like, you know, we talk about virtual reality, but I think what we call reality is in a, a, a form of virtual reality because we are so buffered from that which actually our sort of our biological imperatives just through the way we've built up civilization. Or yeah, that's why um, I don't know, well, but that, that's why I felt at the time. <laughs> well, it's exactly what Jordan Peterson talks about. I mean, he talks about that from an academic standpoint, but, and, and when he did that, it never spoke to me at any deep level. But when you just told that story now, oh my goodness, so many memories came up for me. <laughs> One was, um, 
we spent a month in Haiti back in the uh, early 80s. Mm -hmm. And that was when baby Doc Duvalier was still the um, dictator. Mm -hmm. So you had to, every time you moved from village to village, you had to show your papers. There were big uh, watchtowers with guys with AK-47s from the government, um, making sure nobody went anywhere they weren't supposed to go. Oh. The people were living in desperate poverty. Um, it was, it was really eye-opening, and and yet there was a lot of joy. I mean, that was that was the mind-blowing part of it. Was some of these people would walk barefoot ten miles over the mountains to get to the church service on Sunday morning, and they'd be so filled with joy and worship. Yeah. And um, then we got back to we flew back into Miami before going back home to the Midwest, and in Miami there was this thing on the news media of this woman complaining because she and her son had to live in her mother's house because she didn't get enough money from the government to pay for her to have her own house. <clears throat> and I'm thinking she's living in this three bedroom, two bath house <laughs> with her mother. Yeah. And, and that's to her, that's the end of the world. But here were these people living in cardboard boxes and eating grapefruit rinds in Haiti. Yeah. And it was so hard to readjust back to any semblance of reality after we came back. Yeah. And, and then the same thing happened to me during the three years I spent in Japan, because there we were meeting people that, all the people that also spoke English, most of the people that we met that also spoke English were also missionaries. Mm -hmm. So all of our conversation was about how can we meet people? How can we have authentic relationships with people? How can we get to know them and, and love them and speak to them about Christ? And, um, and then all of the Japanese people I was meeting were people who were interested in learning about deep things and wanted to have answers for their lives. And, <laughs> and then I come back to the United States and the world is just going on its merry way. And even in church, there was no depth. There was no uh, commitment. It, it was just so unreal. And, um, but eventually I readapted to that and my life floats along the same way now. And it, yeah. it's a, it's a very strange thing. You know, and, and this, okay, this is, <laughs> the conversation I had yesterday was at what point, and this is really a weird tangent, but at what point did beds get so soft? And this is okay. And this is, this kind of comes down to making the world conform to us versus us conforming to the world. I'd read an article some years ago about like a 90 year old lady in England who had slept on a hardwood floor in her house ever since the blitz. So ever since, you know, she got used to sleeping in the closet when the Germans were, you know, doing air raids over London. And so she'd just gotten used to sleeping on the floor. And so she'd slept on the floor the rest of her life. And uh, people were like, well, don't you get sore? And she's like, no, your body gets used to it. And so I'm just used to sleeping on the floor. So that's what I'm going to do, you know? And, and I thought, well, I mean, obviously at a certain point, I mean, beds weren't always, you know, like three feet thick. Um, I mean, I remember beds not being three feet thick. Like, <laughs> I, I point, remember when it happened. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, because it was a, it was a marketing ploy by the hotels. Okay. One hotel came up with the idea of these wonderful pillow soft beds and, um, and the fancy sheets and all that kind of stuff. And then other hotels started to compete with them on that level so that hotels had to have, and then the hotels started offering that kind of bedding as a, something that you could buy which of course got the stores thinking, well, if people are interested in buying that kind of bedding, then we should be yeah. producing it. And at least I, that's the way I remember it. Yeah. And that was probably all back in the, I want to say the nineties maybe because, well, and that might just be because it wasn't until the nineties that I was in any sort of situation where I would have any money to stay in a hotel. So, uh, so yeah. maybe that's how I discovered it, but. Yeah, it, it, it's, it's just interesting. And then I thought a little bit about the princess and the pea you know, and, and how to, you know, <laughs> but and like at some point people went from sleeping on the ground to sleeping on a bench with a bit of a pad on it and did that for probably, I don't know, at least centuries, if not longer. Um, 
And then in the last century or so, we've gotten, well, you need a box spring, then you need a mattress, then you need a pillow top of the mattress, and then you need to have a, a like, <laughs> so, and then you just wake up with a stiff back. And, so, spe so speaking of the princess and the pea, and I think this fits together too, have you ever heard of this concept of hormesis? I have not. Okay, I think it's H-O-R-M-I-S-I-S. Okay. And uh, hormesis is kind of the big thing in the health and fitness seg segment right now. And the idea is that, oh, well, one ex example would be high interval intensity training, oh, okay. high intensity interval training, yeah. where you, maybe you're jogging at a normal pace and then for a burst of 20 seconds, you go so fast that your heart is just pounding out of your chest and then you go back to your normal jogging. Yeah. Or, or you lift weights just for a few seconds that are way beyond your capacity. Um, there are also certain phytotoxins that you, we take in in our food that cause little amounts of stress to our bodies, but mm -hmm. the end result is very beneficial. Yeah. Um, jumping into ice cold water and then getting out again. These kinds of things, these stressors are apparently what can build our endurance and our capacity beyond what we imagine. Yeah. And, and so that would go back to your um, three hours a night sleeping and you know, looking at what is, what is real versus what is not real, right? Yeah. But, but I think this whole idea of hormesis is very interesting because it seems to me to filter into just about every domain and every area of life. Actually, I have a story about that. I didn't, I didn't have a name for it, but like the high intensity interval training and, and, uh, and just to keep it short last, um, what was it, last summer, last summer I got the idea in my head that I needed to be able to do a full stride run for a quarter mile, not a jog, but a full stride run for a quarter mile. Um, and, and still be a functional human being at the end. <laughs> and, and that's, 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 that's the key. And yeah. No, years and years ago, I had done what a half marathon and, uh, wow. you know, that was, you know, and that and I hate distance running, to be honest, but <laughs> I always had. And, uh, and then there you just, you jog however much, you jog however much, and you build up mileage. And then, you know, anyway, so last summer, I decided that I needed to be able to do a quarter mile. Okay, so I, I built myself up and I was running, you know, 200 yards repeatedly, you know, full stride, and then occasionally doing some sprints, and then, you know, 400 yards. And uh, one day, I just got the idea, man, I'm just going to try jogging. Like, I don't know, I'm going to go jog to that corner and back. And so I went and jogged to the corner and back, then decided to see how far it was. It was three miles. It was easy. I had no idea. Like, what kind of a corner was that? <laughs> <laughs> you know, it was, yeah, there's was, there was a there like a supermarket on the one corner from, from our place. I thought you meant like the corner around the corner from my <laughs> yeah, a really long driveway. <laughs> Well, yeah, yeah. So it was, it was, it was, it was an interesting thing. So I thought, well, wow, that's apparently that's the way to train for that. And then I find out after the fact, I just read an article yet this week that that's actually how you're supposed to train if you're gonna try and run distance, so that you can actually get your stride halfway decent at speed, because otherwise you just wind up with a horrible stride, which I'm sure I have. But, but, uh, and then, and then to the other part too. Um, in the last a little bit better than a year. Um, I, I started lifting weights because, you know, I'm not getting any younger. I've had bad shoulders. I've, I've thrown out about everything that you can throw out, you know, thrown out my back, thrown out my shoulders, thrown out my knees, thrown out my front, probably. I don't know, the first person to do that. But, uh, and so I started lifting weights because I figured, you know, the osteo part, I'd been to physical therapy and like, okay, so the orthopedic part of things, I need to have that you know, a little bit more ship shape. And, uh, and, uh, so I did that and I used to get tendonitis, tennis, elbow, golf, was elbow, all that stuff. And basically I just started lifting heavy and, you know, they always say, don't lift with your back. The number one, I, I haven't had a back, I, I haven't had a real back pain since I started doing deadlifts again. And, you know, it's like lift a few hundred pounds once a week. Okay. My back is great. My back hasn't ever felt better in my life since I was a little kid, you know? So it, it kind of plays into the same thing, you know? And it, and it kind of, it, I call it microdosing suffering, 
is kind of what you're doing. <laughs> just apply a little bit of suffering so then you don't have to deal with suffering later on. <laughs> and that's kind of what it boils down to. I suffer a little now, I won't suffer so much later. <laughs> that's that's great. <laughs> So, so Travis, you said you had some things that you had been thinking about. Did, did you take notes of any stuff that you wanted to talk about? Well, I should have taken better notes is what I, what I should have done. But I, uh, Well, I have plenty of other things. but I, I, I have know. college that's proof that I should have taken better notes. But um, no, I read uh, History and English Words by Owen Barfield. Oh, okay, yeah. Paul Vanderclay has been talking a lot about Owen Barfield lately. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And, and, and I read that book i got it off of it's what archive.org so it's you know basically free to check out if you just create an account there um and i should have probably read that book 25 years ago i, I read that book it was like owen barfield apparently had thought of everything that i thought i'd thought for the last 25 years about <laughs> language and, everything. and it's, it's all right there i mean and it really is it's one of those things where you sit in there reading a book and you're like okay I'm, I'm, I'm just walking down a road that i thought i'd built so there we go <laughs> <laughs> and it's interesting. It was originally written, I think, in 1925. And basically, um, the premise of it is going through, and he went through the Oxford English Dictionary, through the etymology sections, um, for all of these words that were derived from Proto-Indo-European. And, 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 and the time of the writing of the book is, is fairly evident because he refers to it as Aryan, which mm. in the post-World War II world, we totally don't do. But uh, so talking about um, the languages derived from Proto-European and how the words, if you go back and you search the history of the words, it gives you an idea of the mindset and the world of the people who were using those words. And then the ways that those language groups overlapped each other into modern English. So it's, it's really an interesting study. And, and uh, you know, from an historical standpoint, obviously, there are things from 1925 that don't stand up today. Um, you know, there's you know, I, I, just, just the idea of Proto-European uh, language, uh, Proto-Indo-European language following a particular uh, population doesn't really match what, uh, you know, anthropologists and, and uh, philologists and whomever else are saying today. But, but uh, overall, the book is, still stands up pretty well. There's just a couple of things like that that uh, a person needs to bear in mind if, I'm not sure I understand what you're saying, following a certain population in, in what way? Oh, okay. Uh, well, um, there was a belief coming out of the 19th century, which, which makes sense. It means that the uh, people who were speakers of Proto-Euro-Indo-European, Indo-European, wow, Aryan. That's why he used Aryan. There we go. But, uh, <laughs> but it was a population, it was a particular group, like a race or a people or that sort of thing and that they had expanded into uh, Northern India and had expanded into uh, you know, Western Asia and then Eastern Europe, and then into Europe and you know, Western Europe and so on and so forth. And the way language tends to move is you have, you might have a population that's the original core of it, but then the population moves and then the language spreads with the people who the population contacts. And so then the language group winds up transcending the particular, say, tribe or kingdom or whatever group it winds up working with. So, so you have maybe multiple sort of groups with that language, um, especially a language that spreads and moves and becomes very dominant. You'll wind up with multiple peoples sharing the same language, kind of like English is today, or you know, the term mm -hmm. lingua franca, you know, mm -hmm. deals with how uh, you know the Frankish language was dealt with, or the way Latin became, the way Greek became. Um, in the ancient world, where you have multiple people speaking those languages, uh, the proto indo european languages probably it, all the same. But it's still, it might have been true in uh, early civilization before there was so much travel and communication possible between different cultures. Yeah. I mean, that, that language was with a given, given people group and then. Yeah, it, so it might have been true that from that standpoint. Yeah, and and I think it, it probably holds up, you know, from the when you go back to the root of it, and then once you start getting into the spread, that's where that starts to become a, a more difficult thing to hold up. But I remember uh, reading, and this was like a late nineteenth century book, where the basic idea was that Proto-Indo-European spread into um, sort of 
the Greek area and, and, and north of there, the uh, Eastern European area, uh, because of these Proto-Indo-European warrior horsemen who carried it in there and, and dominated the people and then brought in agriculture and all this sort of mm -hmm. thing. And, and, and that's the part that basically archaeology and anthropology certainly makes it less simple. It's like, okay, well, there's phases of this and that, and there's a mixture of agriculture in here, and there's, you know, all of these things sort of interleaving. So, and the interesting thing is Barfield actually kind of intuitively puts that over the top of it anyway when he's, discuss when he's discussing how the uh, language developed as successive waves of Indo-European derived language groups you know, lapped over each other, you know, so, mm -hmm. you know, his example, obviously, in England was with the Celts, so the Celts were the earliest known, you know, European language group people settled on the British Isles, and then they were overrun by the Latin-speaking Romans, and then they were overrun by the uh, Angles and Saxons, and then they were overrun by Vikings, and they were taken over by the French Normans, and then, That's why our spelling is so complicated. <laughs> and then after that, then they smuggled in a bunch of French uh, legalese, and then they were smuggled in a bunch of Latin legalese, and of course a Latin, bunch of Latin uh, ecclesial stuff, and then you know a bunch of Greek, you know. <laughs> and so all of those are Indo-European languages that just got rolled on top of each other. And so each time there's a successive wave or trend for one of those, um, it sort of illustrates something about where people's mindsets were at the time that that was happening. Well, so what, what would you say is the main takeaway that you got from his book? Um, well, it kind of fits to a degree into um, one thing that I, I mentioned back uh, in, the, in the previous conversation, um, words as little containers for meaning. Mm -hmm. And with that, he, you know, sometimes there are words that we're using where we're smuggling in certain amounts of meaning that we don't necessarily, that I, at least I don't think we necessarily, we might intuitively, we, we might infer it from the words, but we wouldn't define them with what we're inferring. You know, so there's a little bit extra there that we're inferring from the word, but we don't necessarily define it that way. And what we're inferring is very sense. often something that it's, that's, that's, that's bringing in from the past. From Can you give me an nothing. example? Um, well, let's see, I'm trying to think like the example I used last time, um, believe, for example. So believe brings in something more than just accepting the proposition, you know, dogs are mammals. You know, to believe is, is, is some element of, of value attached to the proposition and, and, and that. And that comes from the fact that, you know, believe, you know, formally carried an amount of uh, to love along with it and to trust. And so that winds up rolled into, even though we don't necessarily, we wouldn't necessarily write out the definition of believe to be to love or to carry a value of something or to trust in something. Maybe mm -hmm. trust would be the closest we would get. Um, yeah. Well, it seems like you don't need to use the word believe if you're just talking about a fact. Yeah. Right? Um, yeah. Like dogs are mammals or the sky is blue. Yeah. Um, I guess if we get to the level that we have to start using believe for that, then we've really gone over the edge. I mean, we're already <laughs> almost over the edge as a civilization. In terms of <laughs> what we are sometimes called upon to believe, but, yeah. um, but at least we still think of those as facts. So, I mean, I know, I know that the sky is blue. I see that the sky is blue, but yeah. I believe you could say, I believe that the sky is blue because of the density of the air particles, you know, or whatever. Um, yeah. I guess even if I actually knew what the fact was there, even that I would have to say, I know. So, but to, uh, I, I believe this airplane will fly. Yeah. Okay, we're getting a little closer to it. Or, or um, a tightrope walker says, I believe that this tightrope will carry me from this building to that building. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, and, and there was, and, and there's just a, a bunch of little little gems in that book, uh, just all throughout it. Um, one of them, let's see if I can find. Um, he quoted Thucydides um, on one of them. I'll see if I can find that 
Thucydides. I actually did note that. Did you say Thucydides? Yeah. The, the Greek guy? Yep. Yeah, okay. Okay, okay. I don't have the Thucydides quote, but I do have his synopsis of the quote, which is basically the, roughly the same thing. Okay. And the quote is, when any significant change takes place in the moral standards of a community, it is immediately reflected in the general shifting in the meanings of common words. Oh, well, yeah, we've certainly seen that. Yeah. <laughs> and uh, what Thucydides had written, um, I'll have to look for that quote at some point and I'll send it to you when I find it, um, was basically something similar along those lines. It was basically when the morality of the people changes, then they say that good is bad and that bad is good. And, and I mean, it sounds like basically like Thucydides lives right now and is griping about today is <laughs> pretty much how the quote lives up. It's, well, it's, there's also something in one of the prophets in the Old Testament that says exactly the same thing, that, yeah. you know, there's, that you're, you've come to a place where you're saying that good is bad and bad is good. And, yeah. And, you know, there's and, nothing new under the sun, in other words. Well, that's the thing. Is it's, you know, really, if you look at where we are, I mean, Camille Paglia has done a bunch of stuff on this, too. If you look oh, at where we are. She's brilliant. She's brilliant. Yeah. Yeah. And we look at where we are as a society, we're far from being the first to be in, in sort of in the phase that we are. I mean, obviously with the technology that we have, but the Western world isn't the first to start dealing with some sort of fracturing. And that's really kind of what we're doing. It's this disintegration. We're deintegrating all of these things. Um, you know, for some reason due to postmodern, uh, yeah, postmodern approaches are probably part of it, but I think there's some underlying philosophical things that have been bubbling under for the last couple hundred years that have probably made that prevalent, I guess. But well, when you just used, used that word disintegration and you broke it down to deintegration, and I thought, wow, that takes me right back to your first comment about skill versus knowledge, that, that um, knowledge needs to be integrated by mm -hmm. applying skill. Um, otherwise, it's quite useless, right? So um, in our culture today, we seem to have gotten to the place where it's all about knowledge and information and not so much about skill. There are a few people who are doing artisan crafts and, you know, um, home cooking and <laughs> making special kinds of bread in bakeries. You know, there's still some of that skill-based life out there, but most people are making their living based on knowledge, information, technology, and not, not so much in applying, um, especially we're not working with our hands as much anymore. We're not working with our bodies. So, and like we were talking before with muscle memory, those, those things aren't integrating into the way our brains are wired. Yeah. So it is going to have an impact on the language. Right? And I think, I think also to, to play to that too, I think um, the way we viewed education and work, um, and may, may, maybe this is my, my official ax grinding for being a semester short on a bachelor's degree, but, uh, but you run into it a lot in the workplace though, where people will conflate having education in a thing with having skill in the thing. And, you know, very often people, you know, in doing hiring, it's a way to kind of cover your backside so that you don't hire someone who's utterly ill-equipped to perform a task. Um, because you can have a thing on a piece of paper that says that they at least have been formally educated on this. But formal education, by and large, outside of vocational education, doesn't teach skill in the thing. Mm -hmm. Interestingly enough, even um, in Fargo, there used to be a place called uh, Dakota Business School. And, and it was, I mean, this is before there was um, really sort of standardized curricula for a lot of this stuff. And the guy who ran it basically had students um, doing the stuff that he thought was appropriate for running a business, but they had fake money and they had to use this money throughout the course of the semester. And they had to set up a fake business and they had to do all this stuff. And it was basically the running of a business in the school. And then all of the stuff, doing the book work, doing this and that, and, you know, keeping track of, you know, and, and all of these things. And it was basically all applied business school. That's pretty much what it boiled down to. And it was apparently, well, at least it was successful with a lot of the early business people in Fargo. And, <laughs> and you don't hear about a lot 
of things outside of, once again, vocational education that approaches the skill side of things as well as just the academic. And I think we've gotten so far into the idea of like, well, you need to be academic, you need to have training on this. Like, okay, so I was a history major 20 years ago. So if I'd have been a computer science major 20 years ago, would anything I've learned in college matter now? <laughs> What if, good you, would if, it you learned it, if you learned it last year, it's not very useful now. Well, that's exactly it. That's exactly it. So, I mean, <laughs> yeah, so the, it, the world is moving so fast on us that, that information is, is kind of useless. What you need is to know where to find information. Yeah. Right? Yeah. And so my and, daughter who my daughter who has kept me somewhat technical all these years at least <laughs> at least i can do the simple things uh she can find anything at a moment's notice so yeah. so at her and her generation they don't really store up information so much because they don't really need to they just access it on the computer but then that makes me wonder i don't know if you ever saw that tv series jeremiah no it's a, a dystopian world in which all the Everyone over the age of puberty dies from some virus. Oh. And, and it, this has all happened 15 years before the series starts. And uh -huh. so the oldest people in that world are like 25 years old. But, but all of them were under the age of puberty when mm -hmm. this happened. So none of them know how to run anything. All yeah. the computers are gone. All the phones are gone. All the electricity is gone. And you can imagine it very quickly devolves into... Yeah total catastrophic world but it makes me wonder what will happen if we ever get that big EMP and it knocks out all the computers nobody <laughs> knows how to do anything anymore you know especially well, the younger generation because they well, just it's, it up on Google it's one of those things too so um, part of the thing with my job one of the things that uh, we support is this uh, identity management system okay mm -hmm. so it's, it's this identity management system um, for the federal government Okay, so it's, it's basically it's a computer web portal where people register and, and, and it, it verifies their identity and then it uses that for managing. It. Um, and so like any other thing, you have a development site, that's the development version of the same. And you have a, a test site, which is the test version of the same. Then you have the production site, which is the version that people use. And, and I had a question yesterday about the development site because we don't get a lot of people asking about that. And one of our employees was, was asking about uh, someone was doing a test account and they were getting uh, an error when they were trying to do identity verification. And, you know, so what's, and they said, hey, give them the answer on it. And, you know, we have, we have a knowledge base, we have knowledge base stuff set up on it. And, you know, and, and the answer is of course, because it's test, it's all fake information. You know, there, there's no real information in tests because we're testing. And, and so identity verification can't work. You just have to manually bypass it because we're just testing it. And, and so we aren't using real people's data. And the coworker and I were talking about this. And, and we had started early on when this thing was first launched and there was no documentation on it. It was just a nightmare. And, you know, we think of it because we had to, we didn't have more granular information. There was nowhere to really look things up with these heuristics just built into the whole idea. Okay, test information doesn't matter. It only matters insofar as that you can use it for testing. So if you have a test user information, it can be blah, blah, bo from blah, bland. And it doesn't matter as long as you can fill out the forms and things submits, the accounts created, you can do the stuff and, mm -hmm. and that sort of thing. Whereas production information is super important. It is beyond important because that's what the whole system is actually set up for. Mm -hmm. But for people who started when that wasn't the environment where you could just look up answers, you'd never have to develop that heuristic at all. You don't have to develop all these mental shortcuts for, okay, well, here's the basic reasoning for this, this, and this. And then I can just build all my knowledge off of that. But if you can just look it up, then you just look it up. So you don't have that built-in heuristic that you need to deal with. Mm. So, and it was just sort of, and I'd never thought about it that way until we actually talked about it. It's like, well, okay, that's a thing to consider when we're looking at training. So, so, in other, so uh, let me see if I'm following you. So if, 
if I apply this to the real world, yeah, it's kind of the idea of um, the way education used to work in the old days, especially if you go back to the classical view of education, the first six years or so of a child's education was memorizing a lot of data and information. And then yeah. when they get into junior high and they start asking a lot of questions, yeah. that's a time for doubt and, and, and questions and um, trying to figure out what's going on in the world and maybe some rebellion. But then when you get into the, the high school arena, that was supposed to be in the classical trivium education. Mm -hmm. That was supposed to be the time that you begin to take all this data that you learned and then you take the questions and you begin analyzing and, and coming up with some way of viewing the world and understanding civilization and history and so forth. <clears throat> so you're building one body of knowledge on top of another body of knowledge. You're putting the building on top of the basement. But I think what you're saying right now is that because people can just look things up so swiftly that they, they don't have a matrix of information into which to fit that new data that they're, that they're looking at. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Is that it's a, like, a close analogy? I think so. I think so. I think it's um, to, to, to give another sort of an example. Let's say your car has a check engine light, right? Mm -hmm. this, this, this happened with my wife's car, brand new. Check engine light. Okay, now, and, and you take it in, and this has been the gripe of people who've done any, you know, whatever mechanics over the years, you know, and you take it in, they, they hook up the thing, and they go, okay, well, it has this code, we replace this part, and, <laughs> and, and uh, well, you could do that, and people do this all the time. If you look on the internet, if you ever own a, you know, a car, look up, look up error codes. And there are people who will look up an error code on their car because you can buy a reader and you can hook it up. I have a check engine light. Error code blah. Okay, when you look it up, I need to replace this part. And so then they buy the part and they replace it and it didn't fix the error code. And then they go on web forms and they say, it didn't fix the error code. Well, you can replace this other part that worked for me. And so then you buy the other part and they replace the thing. But they never understand how the system works. Then you can get a check engine light from having your gas cap on loose. <laughs> But, you know, you, well, you wouldn't know to check that because that's not what the code told you, you know? Mm -hmm. You know, you could probably get a check engine light from running it out of gas, you know, for, so, for some cars, so, you know. So the way that relates to, to our lives is that there's a certain received wisdom that we get from previous generations that if, if the younger generation is dependent completely on Google for everything <clears throat> and they're not listening to their their adult counselors right yeah <laughs> they're not getting the received wisdom which I, I would say that's like you know what we would call um what all the things that my mom used to say you know yeah. and and my mom's generation they had so much stuff that they understood about how the way the world works and i don't even know how they knew it because much of it hasn't even come to light until recent studies have been done about you know, yeah. what, what's proper nutrition or um, um, if you get a bee sting, how do you get the stinger out? You know, well, you put a poultice on it and yeah. you cover it with, I don't know, mustard and baking soda or some weird thing like that. And that'll draw the stinger out. And yeah. how did they know all that stuff? But, but it's that received wisdom that, that you get that you don't get if you're looking stuff up online. You might, you might find 25 hacks online for how to do yeah. this and you'll get... 25 different possibilities but then you're flooded with information you have too many options and how do you know which one is true right yeah. or or you know the one i think of you know you think about like a dystopian um show or, or movie or something what i always think of is like okay civilization is collapsing and everyone goes to the grocery store and takes all the food yeah and okay so what are you going to do for food after that where does food come from and there's a significant portion of America's population that doesn't go past the store, that doesn't think beyond the store. Mm -hmm. And it's almost a little frightening in a way when you think about that. Like, well, well, that's what you're supposed to do. You go there and that's where the food is. What if it isn't there? I don't know where food is there. Where does food come from? Well, it comes from somewhere else. And, and that's, a liver, that's a life or death thing. 
when, I mean, but it's, <laughs> it's stable. We don't have to deal with it, but it's a bit of information that if people were actually in that situation, I think that's actually how a lot of people would respond. They go to the store, there's nothing there. What do you do? Well, I guess I'll die. <laughs> well, that, that goes even deeper when you, uh, you know, Jordan Peterson talks a lot about what happened in the Soviet Union, um, especially, I think it was in the twenties when the, when the commissars or whatever decided that the, the farmers who were a little better off than the other farmers, some farmers maybe had built up a big enough farm that they could hire somebody mm -hmm. and all of a sudden, because they had employees, they were the enemy. Yeah. They were capitalists and they were the enemy. And so they had all of them killed. I think they were called kulaks. They had all yeah. the kulaks killed and guess what? Then there was no food. <laughs> yeah. Now, now what do you do? You know, it got so bad that people were eating their children. It's just, yeah. um, and so you have to wonder in today's world, if, if all the food runs out in the grocery stores and nobody knows where to find food, exactly what's going to happen. You know, but would we begin to venerate farmers? Would we begin to venerate that they know how to make food grow or, um, can they even grow food anymore if they don't have the technology and the computerized combines and, and all of that, you know? Yeah, we're, we're, technology is a wonderful thing and I'm really thankful for all the advances and how it's raised so many people out of poverty in the world and all of that, but we're also really putting ourselves in a box. Well, and that's, that's the interesting thing too, because I think about, okay, so I grew up basically, our farm was basically roughly 1960s technology. Mm -hmm. Rough. I mean, we had, we had some stuff that was newer than that, but I mean, it was, but the general way we approached farming was, I mean, pretty much the same as people would have, you know, in the late 60s, probably early 70s. Before in the 70s, farming really started to grow, especially up here. You know, it was, it was uh, you know, grain farming got big, acreage started, you know, getting added on that sort of thing. And, and, and my dad never really got into the, the, the rat race on that. But what we did wasn't dramatically different from the way farming had been done for millennia, really. I mean, there's the mechanization element, but the basic tillage, all of that, all of that's basically the same, a variation of the same thing. Now, since I moved to town, um, no till, Tillage has changed. The, the entire nature of tillage has changed. Like I'm an idiot when it comes to farming at this point. Um, probably was then too, but I'm really an idiot now. Um, because like, like, oh yeah, we're doing this and this and this. I have no idea what we're doing. I, I could run the combine probably because a bunch of the stuff is automated. That part hasn't changed so much, but the tillage and, and, and a bunch of that stuff is so different than it was 25 years ago. I, I wouldn't know what I was doing out there. I could... <laughs> I'd be better off with a plow and an ox and I'd be closer to right than I would be with something that's new right now. So um, I have one more thing I wanted to ask you about if I could. You, you wrote something on a comment um, when we were talking about, I think we were talking about um, silence and blank spaces. Ah, yes. So I'm going to read your quote to you. Good. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> and then I'm going to make a little, a little segue to something else that I saw online. So you said, I think the difficulty with an additive approach, and you were talking about um, having to add something to the blank page, like starting a story from scratch or starting a song from scratch, or for me, starting a painting on a white canvas. I think the difficulty with an additive approach, which I think pretty much everybody finds in the blank page, is that by starting with nothing, you are conceptually starting with everything. The problem with everything is that we can't come even remotely close to understanding it. Even the addition of what we might call arbitrary chaos limits the field from an infinite potential to something dramatically smaller in scope. So instead of imposing something totally concrete on infinite abstraction, you're forming something from limited chaos. 
it's chaotic, but not so formless that your mind isn't able to find useless pattern, useful patterns in it. So I really, really, really liked what you said. And part of the reason that I really liked what you said, um, well, the whole thing is levels and levels of deep, I think. But I had just watched a video of Dr. Sharon Glotzer, G-L-O-T-Z-E-R. And she's a particle physicist. And she did a, a lecture on entropy, information, and order in soft matter. And I'll, I'll link to this on the video. And she was talking about research that they, she was kind of doing an overview of research that's been done over the last like 20 years mm -hmm. on these things. And they, they studied many different shapes of particles. And they found that if you take any given set of shapes, if they're all the same shape and you put them in a container, mm -hmm. they'll just be random in the container. But as you remove more and more space, until you get to the place where there's no space left in the container and uh, they've not changed the temperature or any other external force. Mm -hmm. Once they've removed all of the space, those particles will self-organize into a crystalline structure. And so she oh. says, entropy alone is doing this. Oh, wow. So she's saying that entropy actually has a function of creating organization rather than diminishing organization. But what I thought was interesting about what she said was, I think she's missing something. Now, I'm not a physicist, uh -huh. but, but they're actually inputting something when they remove the space. The action of removing the space of putting this inside a very tight constraint, mm -hmm. a boundary, that is also an element in the, in the study that they're doing. And you can't throw that out. You can't say with entropy alone, because no. it wasn't entropy alone. It was entropy operating inside this boundary that has no space in it, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. And so then that made me think about what you said. Um, instead of imposing something totally concrete on infinite abstraction, you are forming something from limited chaos. It's chaotic, but not so formless that your mind isn't able to find useful patterns in it. Do you understand the yeah. connection? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So, do you have yeah. any comment on that? That's deep. <laughs> <laughs> well, so, I wouldn't do, attach those two together, but yeah. Um, do you want to you want to think about that a little bit, and we'll yeah, have I'll have, to think, I'll have to I'll have to read about this. Yeah, really and cool. we'll have another conversation. Yeah. Wow. Be because yeah. I th I think there's really something there, and it it somehow connects to something that's inside your brain. <laughs> so so I want to find out more about that. Yeah, and and one thing I, I've been I've been thinking about too. I think when we think chaos, and then is I was thinking about chaos too, I mean, kind of like randomness. Um, is there such a thing as, is chaos only perceived? I guess is the question. Is chaos simply perceived or does it exist? I've been, I've been wondering about that. I've been wondering about that. Because now if we, if we take on the godlike Van der Kleyen monarchical vision, um, not saying that Paul's godlike, but uh, that it's a monarchical vision. Okay, so so to God, so to 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 God, there's no such thing as too much information, because all information that exists is still below that which God is and understands and knows. So, at which point, none of that would be chaotic, mm -hmm. because what we deem chaotic is that which is beyond what we can process. Or Yes, beyond, I've been thinking about that. I think it's beyond that which we can perceive. And, yeah. um, so 
so Jordan Peterson talks about the known and the unknown, but he pictures the known as being inside our, our boundary of civilization and the unknown is that which is just outside yeah. the village, just outside where the light and the heat are existing so that, and, and then he likens that to chaos. And so he yeah. makes this world of, yeah. of order and chaos, but I really think it's more like the known that yeah. it's the known and the unknown because what is unknown. Okay. Let me put it this way. I think humans are perfectly capable of creating chaos. Cause I think about, I can, I can create chaos on a canvas. I can do that. Yeah. Um, Maybe I can't. Maybe free will <laughs> doesn't exist. So when I think I'm creating chaos, it's really something else that's creating the chaos. But, but anyway, I think in the natural world, there is the known and the unknown. But are, we're, we're, we're over time, aren't we? I guess so. <laughs> <laughs> well, let's pursue this in our next talk. Let's, okay. Let's give us something to talk about, the known and the unknown and chaos, because I think this is, this is really where I want to get to. So if you're willing... For another conversation we'll do it all right and maybe chaos is formlessness uh-huh maybe yeah. that's the absence of form that's that's where it started out so let's yeah. let's follow that thread because i think we're on to something all right <laughs> okay good talking with you travis likewise you have a good day you too bye-bye